Hello and welcome to another edition of the Father and Son Podcast. Uh, I'm Patrick. And I'm Gavin. That's my dad. Yes. Uh, we're going to do a little something different uh, for these next uh, few segments. Um, I know that since there's no baseball on right now, there's not much to talk about, no predictions I have, no what's going really on in baseball news. Uh, so we're going to look in the past. We're going to look in the history of uh, each baseball team and come up with our own personal dream team or a fantasy team. Uh, if they've ever donned um, a certain jersey, uh, we're going to go team by team. Uh, we're going to start locally. Uh, we're going to start with the Baltimore Orioles. And what that is for us, some, so no St. Louis Browns, just focus on the Orioles from 1954 uh, to now. And the requirements, they have to have at least three years of team service time. Uh, so if they're just on the team for half a year, a year, they do not count. They have to have at least uh, three years of being in an Oriole uniform uh, to count. We're going position by position. We're doing best starting pitcher as well, mm -hmm. best overall reliever, best closer, uh, best manager, and as well as just a fun little thing, the uh, best logo we think um, that the, in this case, the Orioles ever did. Uh, we'll start with catcher. Uh, we'll kind of ping pong this back and forth. And then we will uh, hopefully kind yeah. of get through the next team. And then we'll probably go Nats uh, next. And then maybe work, kind of take requests or either work yeah. um, from that, if that makes any sense. We'll cover all 30 um, teams in Major League Baseball. And I was lucky to see both stadiums. So I got to see Memorial Stadium and Camden Yards. Yes. And I got to see people as far back as in 1970 on up. So I am I think I'm well-versed with this one. In case you couldn't tell, he might have a better idea of some of his older players. Yes. And I might have some more younger players uh, on uh, my fantasy team, if that makes any sense. Right. And the best stadium was Memorial Stadium, by the way. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see that. That's right. Um, so we'll lead off with my dad here. Dad, best catcher in Oriole history. Who do you have? Rick Dempsey. Rick Dempsey. Tell me your reasoning why. Uh, leader, uh, part of the World Championship team, uh, still involved with the Orioles. And if you really think about a grit of a player, it was Rick Dempsey. Yeah, he definitely meant a lot of that to the spirit of the 83 team for sure. Um, MVP. Yeah, he was. He was the World Series MVP that year. Uh, I think with the... With the Orioles, you have three catchers. Dempsey's obviously one of them. I think Chris Hoyles is certainly an, uh, there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, my pick was Matt Wieters. So not surprisingly, he chose someone older, and I went someone younger. Uh, Matt Wieters just, uh, out of those three, the only one to ever win a gold glove. He won two of those uh, gold gloves. So defensively, I don't think you could argue that he's not the best defensive catcher and of those three. Hitter. Yeah, um, just a big man as well. Um, and he had so many years where he had that high throughout rate at second. I mean, no one really... Yeah. stole on Weeders when he was at the peak of his game. Um, so I'm going to go with Matt. Just, and I, I'm, I'm with you. There was a catcher during Earl Weaver's tenure named Earl Williams. That big, big uh, man. Hit a lot of home runs. Wasn't the greatest offensive catcher in the world, but Earl Weaver's philosophy was put two guys on base and hit a three-run home run. He had like 27, 30 home runs as a catcher for a number of years. Uh, back in the uh, 70s and early 80s, he's the dark horse. Not too many people talk about him because he wasn't a great defensive catcher, but offensively, probably the best offensive catcher uh, Baltimore's ever had. Okay. Um, we'll go to first base now, and then again, we'll, we're ping pong in here, so I'll go here. Um, I'm choosing the Hall of Famer, Eddie Murray. Um, I don't, I, I think there's some obviously arguments to, for this one, but he also was a gold glover uh, for the Orioles, which I actually I didn't know until kind of researching this a little bit more. Uh, but I'm going to choose Eddie. Easy choice. Uh, in fact, the two, three are probably down the list pretty far. Um, you well, know. Boo, a lot of people put Boo because he was a first baseman right fielder, but. You know what? I don't remember him playing right field, to be quite <laughs> honest. Uh, Boog was 260 pounds, and uh, he, he couldn't ramble very well. But, I mean, Boog was popular for a lot of reasons. But I only think he got in maybe the 300s for home runs. Eddie's in the Hall of Fame. Um, he really was a very popular Oriole during that era that the Orioles were very good uh, with a great infield. And really, you know, that 80s when they were in the playoffs all the time. Um, Eddie was a big part of that. So, yeah, I mean, an easy choice with Eddie. Mm -hmm. For you to second? Uh, second, Roberto Almar. All right. Um, I have him as well. So yeah. let me hear your reasoning. Hall of Fame. Uh, a lot of people back when he was great said if you're going to start a baseball team, number one choice would be Roberto Almar. Hmm. And Great that average. Was, Great and that was Peter Gammons. And Peter Gammons uh, was a, the guru of baseball back then. And he said he had so many intangibles about fielding, hitting, hitting for power, speed. 
that was a person you want to start your team with because second base back in the day was a light hit hitting position and Roberto changed a whole lot of that. Um, but you know, I mean, when he was there, when they were really good in the late 80s, um, I mean, he was a big part of that team and um, he was a star. And he just, you know, guess, you know, he did some poor choices along the way. But Roberto, I think, uh, was a star. And um, I don't know if he'll get to the, the Hall of Fame, but he was a darn good second baseman. Roberto's in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, we were talking about a three-year minimum. He actually only served three years um, for the Orioles, and it was in the 90s, not the 80s. Okay. Um, and each year he was with the Orioles, he was an all-star, and one of those years, I think he got a gold glove as well. Yeah, um, good. So I think he had more than one gold glove in his career with Toronto maybe as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so Roberto Alomar, at my second place is Brian Roberts by far. Um, I thought he was very talented during his years. Uh, when I mean, he was really an all-star. Same with Moore and Tejada. They're also going to be kind of honorable mentions for me. Um, they were great on really bad Orioles teams. Um, and Roberts, I thought, really uh, had the, like a good spirit. We're talking about your spirit of Dempsey. I thought Brian yeah. Roberts was someone that a lot of people rallied behind. Yeah. Sort of Fans under, loved him. Underdog figure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one dark horse I have is Bobby Gritch. For saying. Yeah. yeah. Great player. Now he's back when they had the Baby Bird Bunch. It was him and Don Baylor and Terry Crowley. And um, this was like 1970. And Bobby Gertz was one of those young guys that came up through Rochester that became a star. And he ended up with the Angels. And he, uh, in my opinion, probably second to uh, Alomar at second base. And Davey Johnson's up there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for shortstop, I'm going to go with Cal. Um, obviously, Cal, for me, is, is more of a shortstop in history than third base. And obviously, I think we both are probably going to have the same third baseman here. Um but Cal had uh, two gold gloves in his whole career. I thought he had more, but he only actually had two. Uh, and both were at shortstop. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you have average, you have the Iron Man. I mean, for me, it's pretty simple that Cal earns the starting shortstop role in this Orioles dream team. Easy choice. Um, again, you know, you're talking about probably number one pick if they had asked, you know, the, the fans, the, their most popular Oriole of all time, he may be number one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he, you know, he's a local kid. Got you know drafted by the Orioles, came up through the system. Mm -hmm. I mean, a true hometown, um, you know, hero and everything else. And you know, it'd be great if he got involved with the Orioles again. But again, um, just an easy choice. Um, you know, all, Hall of Fame, and he'll go down. You know, nobody will overbeat his record for consecutive games. That's true. That's, I do think that's a, one of the few unbeatable records yeah. in baseball. Um, I'm assuming third base is Brooks. Has to be. Yeah, sixteen. Mr. Baltimore. Yeah, human yeah. uh, vacuum, right? Yeah. Correct. Correct. He was great. wasn't the greatest hitter in the world, but boy, would he could pick it. And again, the whole, Baltimore his whole career made Baltimore his home uh, to this day. Standing ovations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just a great personality in the history of baseball. So we have the same infield, differing at catcher, but same infield so far. Yeah. Um, I think also just to shout out, I think if there was a dream team for like a century team, I think Brooks Robinson is your third baseman. Um, defensively, I don't know if there is a better third baseman out there. If you ask Cal, he um, he mentioned the the uh, Adrian the Beltre. Yeah, yeah he did Texas. say Adrian Beltre. Yeah, yeah. Weird yeah. which which, which um, yeah. shocks you. Yeah, Beltre is great. I mean, Arenado in terms of current class, I mean, is yeah. clearly the best third baseman playing baseball right now. Um, but yeah, yeah I got to go with Brooks all time. Outfield, I think, is where we'll we'll differ. And I think mm -hmm. if you're looking at the Orioles, your stars are in your infield historically, dream team wise. Mm -hmm. The outfield. Not so much stars outside. Maybe one, you could argue. Um, but we're going to go with left field first. I don't know who's up if you wanted to go. I'm going to go down Baylor. Okay. Um, another baby bird bunch. Great player. Um, again, when he, he he used to, you know, he rivaled Reggie Jackson during that era about, you know, hitting 28, 30 home runs when, you know, it wasn't, it was a dead ball era and played great left field, you know, batted in the middle of the lineup. And he was the heart and soul back in the day of the Orioles when they had really good teams in the early 70s. So Baylor is my choice, uh, just what he did for the team, and a massive man. Um, good to have on the bench mm -hmm. in a brawl. Yeah. Uh, I went to the 90s on this one. Um, as my, eh, Not all my outfield, but some of my other players are there. Um, I actually went with Brady Anderson. Now, I know there's always some... Brady has a lot of uh, you know fans as well as uh, critics, I almost went with B.J. Serhoff. He was my actually second choice, just kind of seeing both those players in. And this is your left fielder? Yes, yeah, my left fielder. He Bra played right field. No, no, Brady played left, especially okay. in the early 90s. Okay, and he then finished he switched. His, he finished his career, which is a center fielder, right fielder, yep. which is usually the opposite of, you know, you yeah. end your career yeah, in left field right. as a weaker position. Yeah. Um, 
but he played a good amount of years, especially in the early 90s, especially once. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, uh, Camden Yard started that he was more of the left yeah. fielder, and then BJ kind of came in those. Um, yeah. One year he had 50 hitters. home runs. Yeah, and, you know, we all kind of know what happened in that 50 years, but yeah. he got a. Pump you up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but that's Brady. Um, again, I think I got to see him uh, live uh, do like a, what was it called? Like an old timers um, yes. uh, home run derby <laughs> two years ago, I think. And Chris Foyles was there as well. But Brady was yeah. still cranking him deep over the fence. So either he's still on something or he's still naturally strong. And I, maybe a bit combination, but I do think there's just a really, he saw the game well. He did hit well. Um, and he was a vital part of the yeah, Orioles. he was. So, I mean, again, it, you look at Chris Davis hitting 50 home runs and there's a lot of comparison with him and Brady, I think, where for that year he was Mr. Oriole. Mm -hmm. um, and then never had a, a year where it was equal to yeah. that as well. And but, then he was in the front office of the Orioles too. Yeah. Um, and it's a you know, it's a personality again. I think we're going to differ a lot in the outfield. Mm -hmm. uh, but center field, we might have someone in common. Um, I got Freddie Lynn. Tell me more. Freddie Lynn was uh, great with Boston, great with the Orioles, and then I think ended his career in California, lost, you know, the Angels. How many years um, did Lynn play with the Orioles? Three. Okay. He, yeah. The, okay. And he was a free agent, signed a three-year deal. Um, you know, he's always been injury prone, but when he was with the Orioles, he was the glue of the outfield, and he hit well, he fielded well. I think he batted third in the lineup. Um, you know, people forget about Freddie. Um, he was part of the Orioles and everything else, but during his time, very important part of that lineup, and just a leader of the team. And um, you know, he wherever he went, he was the star of the team. Yeah, I went with Paul Blair um, for defense. Um, kind of, you kind of look at my outfield, and my corners will be pretty offensively based. Um, Paul Blair at seven gold gloves, all with the Orioles. Um, so in terms of kind of the most talented defensively center fielder, it would be him or Adam Jones. I was uh, Blair on that one. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Or... You know, the I have a, another dark horse, Al Bumbry, who was yeah. another heart and soul of the Orioles. Batted lead off. Uh, people loved him. He was a scrappy little player, stole bases. Um, I mean, he really, again, was a big part of, you know, their... their just identity of the of the Orioles and love being an Oriole. So uh, yeah, when you know every time they went on the field, number one would be batting number for, you know first on the lineup and everything else. And you know to me, he's right behind Blair as number two and three, um, Adam Jones being fourth. But yeah, I mean those are the people that you know. I mean they've always had strong center fielders, great defensive center fielders too. If you look at it, yeah, Jones so, could hit too. Yeah, more than Blair, right field. Frankie Robinson. Same. I figured that's what we would have the similarity yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's still, I think, in Old Memorial Stadium, he hit one by 500 feet, and they marked it off in the bleachers that were way the hell out of left field. But they, the longest ball I ever hit out of Memorial Stadium, and then they went to travel 500 feet. And again, he came and really turned the Orioles around. He was, you know, the late 60s mm -hmm. and, and all that. 66. I yeah, 66 to 70. And, um, he came in with the greatest, one of the greatest trades the Orioles ever made um, with Cincinnati and then came and just turned the clubhouse around and started a kangaroo club and everything else. And um, he made a mistake. Frank told you about it. Yeah. I think he was the only Triple Crown winner in Orioles history, but I could be wrong. I think you're correct. Um, but yeah, yeah. He, so that was a, a great year. For yeah. DH, I have Harold Baines. Um, I don't know what you had there. Um, uh -huh. Very interesting, though. Fun fact about Harold Baines is that he... A lot of DHs, you know, go from first base to DH, kind of like David Ortiz, for example, or right field, and then go to DH when they kind of get older. Harold Baines was an Oriole that never played a single game in the field. He never yeah. took the field when he was an Oriole. He was always a DH. Never, not, not even an inning at first base or right field just to plug a hole. He was always a DH for every single game as yeah. an Oriole. And if you think about another great Maryland player, him and Cal, if you think about it, Born and raised in Maryland, played for the Orioles, uh, are still living in Maryland and everything else. So they have a lot mm -hmm. of similarities. And Harold, um, Harold Baines used to stop at the Chesapeake Bagel Bakery in Cerner Park and get a bagel every day on the way to Camden Yards. Well, he lives in East. Did he live in, in East St. Michael's? Well, okay, so yeah. he lived in St. Michael's the yeah. whole time he was playing? Yes, um, he commuted every day. So that's a drive. Yeah, but, but he a... stopped for a bagel and that was his halfway point. All right. Little known fact. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into pitching. Start with the starter. Uh, you think you're up? Jim Palmer. Simple choice there, yeah. too. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of great starting pitchers for the Orioles. Yeah. I mean, I looked down the list, and you could rattle off 10 names easily that were fantastic starters. And, you know, Baltimore's, you know, thing was always defense, pitching, you know, timely hitting, and that's what made them great. And starting pitching was a big part of that. They used to go to seventh, eighth inning and then bring in the closer. They didn't have a lot of middlemen because their starters went long distances and kept the game in reach. And they had great starting pitchers when they were great. Uh, Messina's right kind of behind Palmer uh, for great pitchers and everything else. So, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's Palmer uh, and then a whole list of folks. But Mike Messina is also a great player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had Palmer as well. No, no other notes to that. For reliever closer, this is where a lot of, obviously, debate can happen and conversation is very few people go their entire life just as a closer role. You know, they might switch from relief to closer. They go from closer to setup man. Um, but in terms of who I think were best in their positions, I'm going to go with Britton as a closer and then Greg Olson as a setup man reliever. He was also a great closer for a time period, but I think that if building a dream team, I would want Olson maybe being a setup man in the eighth and Britton being that uh, closing out in the ninth, that 2016 season, a .54 ERA for Zach Britton, and he had, I don't know, 60-some consecutive saves in a row. I thought it was just so impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I got to give it to Britton for the for the best closer in Orioles history. I had it just flip-flopped. Okay. Um, Olsen had one of those unbelievable curveballs that he was more, he did it for four or five seasons. Um, so he was great for a longer period of time than Britain. Um, Britain, you know, had some arm injuries and everything else, you know, left the club and all that. But Olsen was a big part of that, and he had a curveball that was unhittable. So, yeah, again, a big part of that. And, um, you know, the other one was Stanhouse, Dan Stanhouse, uh, mm -hmm. back in the uh, – the 80s and everything else who was called full pack because Earl Weaver had to smoke a whole pack of cigarettes because he was on the mound and kept walking people but he used to get out of the innings and he was another character um but yeah that's that's the other dark horse in there yeah uh well speaking of Earl Weaver for best manager the Orioles history I would go with Earl Weaver I don't know easy you that was an easy one else. yeah big Earl fan well then we'll conclude with a kind of a fun thing uh, I printed out all the logo histories of the Orioles um, that they've ever had throughout the years, from 54 all the way to, to now in 2020. Uh, Dad, what's your favorite? The cartoon bird. The new one. This yeah. one right here. Yeah, this is now their permanent uh, or their main logo. Yeah. It used to be the alternate logo for like a decade. So that one's fine. It's funny. So you like the new looking bird, yeah. and I'm actually going to go back to the kind of the 60s bird. I like that shirt or like that design on a shirt a whole lot. I think it's simple. Something about that swinging bird just kind of Makes a lot of sense. If you guys can't see it, I'm choosing the swinging bird. My dad's choosing the cartoon bird. Um, I don't know what's going on with this one where it says Orioles over Baltimore. Not a big fan of that one at yeah. all. Um, but I really do like the older design that was honestly their longest running design as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, both are really good. And the uh, Memorial Stadium, when you walked to the stadium, it was the yeah. bird with a bat that met you uh, as you walked up to the stadium. Yeah. So that was a big part of that. Well, there we go. Well, thank you for joining us on another edition of the Father and Son Pastime. Uh, this, of course, we have such great banter back and forth, and we learn a lot. I thought this was going to take five, six minutes, and we're at 18 minutes. Um, so, always fun talking yeah. with my dad about baseball. There should be 29 more of these posted. Um, everyone out there, stay safe. Keep, hopefully, enjoying this from the comfort of your own home, and we'll slowly put up new content as the what should have been the season rolls on. Yeah, and please provide your comments on our choices and see if you have other choices. Yes, feel free to do that. We uh, definitely appreciate all kind of um, comments and people's opinions on that and see where you're, if we ranked up to yours, if we're completely off base, mm -hmm. uh, share in the comments below. Thanks. Thank you.